いいいいいいいいいいいExcited that uh, uh, for what well, for what is planned, and again <coughs> welcome, welcome. We have a few announcements that I'd like to make. I have a piece of paper here, and it says here that Miriam Michaels, quote, "You are a profit motive and quickly created for Stone Bell Workshop." And Miriam, where is she? First place. So congratulations, Miriam. On it. Uh, Also, like to draw to your attention a, um, a few other um, concerns that we have. Next Sunday, as you will recall, is um, the uh, McCartney Memorial Service, and that will follow soon after the regular worship service. And you you can see that noted in your um, in your bulletin there. 
Also, I, I'm sure you all saw this in, in the paper um, this last Saturday, and the interfaith program Thursday here at UP at 7 o'clock for victims of civilian uh, violence and of warfare. And um, Rabbi Balaban and I worked on this, and it is in no way to supplant uh, the Holocaust awareness and observation, but it is to, to, to begin to lift up a truth that is not being uh, adequately uh, mentioned in our world, and that is there, were, um, there are other people who, who have suffered um, um, horrible trauma, and other people that need to be lifted up and, uh, and, and uh, noted for the, the sufferings that they have, uh, that has befallen them. And, and, and so that's among other things that we're going to be observing here. On Thursday, at least one member of this fellowship will be talking about particular indignities uh, that has befallen him and his family uh, uh, regarding persecution. So that will be uh, on Thursday, and I want to draw that um, to your attention. Evelyn, welcome back. We missed you. you. Bud, welcome back. You've gone for a couple months and they're getting to the pulpit right away. Good for, good for Bud, and I'm glad that they're doing well. Brendan, my daughter and grandson are here, but Brenda is just really sick, and so uh, um, they're at home, and so that's that. Now, is there any other announcements in evening? Yes, Reverend Warren. Anyone who uh, was not able to contribute to the one great hour of sharing last week and wants to this week, please note that on uh, uh, your check. Uh, one great hour of sharing. And this year, I'm going to be sharing the entire for the uh, help of those who have been southern Indiana tornado. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, uh, they have announcements that need to be made. Uh, Alejandro, did you want to? Uh, make an announcement or a presentation of some sort? Oh, she here? Yes. <coughs> Minji? Minji, you need to come here, please. And there is a cake, Minji, in your behalf um, that we'll be enjoying immediately following the worship service during fellowship hour. So congratulations. Uh, I was talking with Jiyun, and Jiyun now, you're the, as soon as Sun Young and the little ones move back to Korea in a couple months, you'll be the only Korean here. <laughs> we usually have 15 to 20 Koreans in our fellowship for the last 15 years now. So those of you who have friends in Korea, invite them, all right? All right, with that said, are there any other announcements at this time? If not, then we'll begin our worship with silence.
what a beautiful morning it is. Will you join me in a call to worship? I'm on the first page of your book. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise and begin with the songs. Our opening hymn, then, as you can see, is uh, number 476. Please rise. sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. You may be seated. Do we have any children here?
Benjamin wiped that smile. <laughs> Does God love you? Does Jesus love you? And why aren't you smiling? Oh, you're supposed to be happy about that. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. What do you mean? Hey, I have a question to ask you. Is there anything that makes that scares you? Do you ever get scared, Logan? Well, I get scared of the dark. You get scared of the dark? Not when I'm wearing my night vision goggles. <laughs> <laughs> when he has his night vision goggles on, he's not scared of the dark. <laughs> How about you? Do you ever get scared? What, what scares you? Making a C on your report card? Is that scary? If you did, okay. Do you ever get scared? Uh, no, but I do get frustrated when you get a B. Never gotten one. You've never gotten a B? Yes. Wow. Do you ever get scared? Yes. No, you don't ever get scared. Cameron, do you ever get scared? Cameron. Colin. 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 <laughs> Starts with a C. Colin. Do you ever get scared? I'm so embarrassed. What scares you? When I sneak up on him. When you sneak up on him. Okay. <laughs> My mom can't scare me a lot. <laughs> Your mom and dad scare you a lot. And I don't think I want to go there. <laughs> God doesn't love you? You always know he will? How about you? You always know he will? How about you, Alexander? Well, you shouldn't know. You're too infamous. How about you? Does God love you? Do you ever get scared of God? No. Do you get scared of God? Uh, no. No? Do you get scared of Jesus? No. <laughs> Carter, do you get scared of Jesus? Good boy. Do you ever get scared of Jesus? That's really important. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you live and serve and love Jesus, you never have to be frightened about God not loving you and no fear, you're exactly right. I can't tell you what's in my pocket. <laughs> you can't tell me what's in your pocket? No, no Oh, I don't want to know. What, what I, what I would like you to do, I don't, I, okay, I'm going to take you, come with me, and I'm going to take you too. I want you to sit over here. You not, not, you haven't done anything wrong. I'm just rearranging. I want you to sit down. Are you going to sit? No, you're going to sit down. Oh, that's right. We do have to sing, don't we? All right, now what we're going to do, I want you to play through. It's number eight. What do I do Now faster! 
universal and the church particular and ask of any prayer request <clears throat> that we need to lift up this morning. Yes? Bob leaves on Tuesday. And that's Afghanistan, right? Yes? My nephew, Joshua, he just com <coughs> uh, completed his officer's training and is going to be stationed in Ohio. 
uh, for his first assignment, and he's studying to be an astronaut. Wow. Anyone else? All right. Then let's turn our attention to prayer. Gracious and heavenly God, we've come to you this day, a week after Easter. <coughs> so many of us filled with joy and crowded together and singing our songs of praise and hallelujahs. And oftentimes, uh, once the glow and the joy begins to fade, so do followers. We're here, and we're following you, and we're happy to be here. We're grateful for this church and this place of healing. And we're grateful that we can lift up those and call them by name who are in need of your fellowship, who are in need to hear your voice. And so we lift up to you my mother, of course, and Jeannie Cole and Hilda Dyer, Lena Lisa in um, Jordan, Gail Moore and Kathleen Olds. I'm grateful that you have restored and are restoring Bud back to good health. I'm grateful that Ralph and Ruth are back home. And we ask that you be with uh, Rob as he uh, returns to Afghanistan, and that you be with Michelle's nephew Joshua as he begins his new journey as well. We're mindful that each one of us is not perfect, but we are forgiven. We're mindful that we mistake, we make mistakes. But in that process, we are learning. And we're grateful that you walk with us as we continue this spiritual journey. We pray also for our country, divided as it is now. And we would ask that somehow, someway, we might find men and women who are about the process of healing instead of division. that we would find leadership that is about peace instead of conflict. That we would find men and women of honor instead of shame. We would ask the same for our local leadership. We pray for our world fragmented and tortured and as always, we would ask that this church, as it has been, will continue to be an instrument of peace. That where there is brokenness, we heal. That where there is division, we unite. That where there is a sickness, um, we bring compassion. That where there is sin, we offer forgiveness. That where there is atheism, we bring Jesus Christ. That where there is warfare, we respond as Jesus would with peace. We pray for our friends throughout the world, notably in the Middle East and in Honduras, and all those who are in harm's way, that they would be protected by you, and that you would encircle them with your angels and bring them home to their families and friends, and that they would be restorers of peace. Gracious and heavenly God, we offer this prayer in your holy name. And this too, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And it is not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so very much. We continue now for the sharing of our tithes and our offerings. <coughs> <coughs>
actually belong to you and for that we give you thanks. We ask you to take these and multiply them, use them in our church and from around the world. For all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Well, our scripture this morning comes from John. I'll be reading three passages from John 1. The first one, verse 35 through 42. The second one, from 18, 15, 17. And the third one is 21, verse 15 through 17. The following day as John was standing with, oh, I want to explain first, I'll be reading from the Living Bible, so this may sound a little different to you than what you may have in front of you. But anyway, this is the one I can get the most out of, and that's what I've got today. So, here we go. The following day as John was standing with uh, two of his disciples, Jesus walked by. John looked at him intently and then declared, See, there's the Lamb of God. Then John's two disciples turned and followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked. He asked them. Sir, they replied, Where do you live? Come and see, he said. So they went with him to the place where he, uh, he was staying and were with him from about four o'clock that afternoon until the evening. One of these men was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Andrew then went to find his brother, uh, his brother Peter, and told him, we have found the Messiah, and he brought Peter to meet Jesus. The next reading then will be from John 1, 15. Simon Peter followed along behind, as did another of the disciples, uh, who was acquainted with the high priest, so that other disciples was permitted into the courtyard along with Jesus. While Peter stood outside the gate, then the other disciples spoke for the, to the girl watching at the gate, and she said, let Peter in. The uh, girl asked Peter, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? No, he said. I am not. And our final th will be from uh, John uh, 21. After breakfast, Jesus and said to Simon, Peter, Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these others? Yes, Peter replied, you know I am your friend. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you really love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I am your friend. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. Once more he asked him, Simon, son of John, are you even my friend? Peter was grieved at the way Jesus asked the question this third time. Lord, you know my heart. You know I am, he said. <coughs> and good Lord bless his reading. Bud, thank you so much, and it's a joy to have you in the pulpit. Bud's had quite a go over the last couple of months, and it's good to see you walking, and uh, and I'm it's just happy to happy to see you. We missed you very much. <coughs> you 
Usually the week after Easter, um, the, at least what I've done, and I know a lot of ministers do the same, they, they, they offer a sermon on the, the Emmaus Walk, right? And, and we've done that quite often. And what I wanted to do is something a little different uh, today. And uh, I think you'll understand that. I had a note here when I was rereading this meditation. I said, and this app goes, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. If I were unscrupulous, I could use this sermon as an altar call. But since I'm an adult in Christ, uh, I'm forbidden to do so. Yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> Uh, the reading from, from Scripture it obviously is about Peter, and uh, it, it begins, of course, with uh, uh, the call to follow, and of course it ends with follow, and in the middle there's the betrayal. And that's kind of what I want to talk about, because that seems to be, uh, to me, to be something that happens to a lot of people along the way. After they give their life to Christ, then they fall away from Christ. And then how do they figure things out to get back? Or how does Christ get them back <coughs> into um, a relationship with him? Now, for over 40 years, I have been engaged in some aspect of the formal and professional uh, Christian ministry. Really, uh, judging by my face, it wouldn't seem to have been that long. But uh, it has been over 40 years. Matter of fact, I was ordained, um, I think, on December 9th, 1973, so that gives you an idea. And then four years of training before that, working in churches. Anyway, <clears throat> as I matured in Jesus Christ, as I spiritually matured in my relationship with Jesus Christ, and those are two important words, spiritually matured in Jesus Christ, I was able to clarify, and have been able to clarify, um, at least part of my relationship with Jesus, and one that I've shared um, with, with many people, and certainly with this fellowship. I've, I've, I've distilled it into this familiar mantra, no guilt, no shame, no fear. People who live in Jesus don't suffer guilt, they certainly don't suffer shame, and they have no fear. And I've said this before, <clears throat> I'm talking about, I'm not talking about my, my wife, God lover, who, who is afraid of rattlesnakes, you know, and particularly every now and then when a snake gets in the house. Oh, sorry, Colleen, I can't invite you out, can I? <clears throat> We're not talking about those kinds of fear. Those are real. There's nothing about that. And, and, and God gives us that kind of fear to, to keep us alive. That's what that fear is for. It's not to hurt us. It's to alert us so that we can avoid something that would hurt us. There's not a matter of fear. It's a gift from God. But there is a matter with fear if you're afraid of God. There is a matter with fear if you're afraid of Jesus. There is a matter with fear if you're afraid of dying. There is a matter with fear if you're afraid of eternal damnation. No guilt, no shame, no fear. I personally know this is true. And I personally know this because as I became more of a, and more of an adult with Jesus and less a preteen, I sloughed off guilt, I sloughed off shame, and I sloughed off fear. And that language is not meant to be harsh. It is meant to be absolutely, precisely uh, what I said. Preteens suffer guilt, shame, and fear. Adults don't. And by that I'm talking about spiritually. People who have an adult relationship with Jesus Christ are not afraid, they're not ashamed, and they have no guilt. Christians who still are stuck at 13 or 14 or 15, pubescent, in their spiritual maturation, still are afraid, still have shame, and still have guilt. 
And that's the best way that you engage, you know, if you had, if there was a such thing as a spiritual formation chart, you know, where we had, uh, you know, gradations of how spiritual you were, then that would give you an idea. I don't like that imagery, but that's the way it is. So when people come to me and they're filled with fear, or they're filled with shame, or they're filled with guilt, I know, I know exactly developmentally where they are. I know exactly developmentally where they are. And where they are is about 13 or 12 or 15 or something like that. That's where they are, spiritually. That doesn't mean that they can't be good lawyers. That can't that mean that they can't be doctors. It doesn't mean they can't be good teachers. It doesn't mean they can't be good parents. It has nothing to do with that. We're just talking about where they are spiritually. This is why I am confident those who claim to be Christian, and by that I mean mature Christians, but still cling to their guilt, their shame, and their fear, really have no idea the real joy of what it means to be in Jesus Christ, and they have no idea what it means to live in Jesus Christ. They have absolutely no idea what it means to live in Jesus Christ. This is not a judgment. This is an observation of over 40 years. And it's an accurate observation. Now, of course, those still in bondage to their negative feelings will disagree with me. So there, I've done it again. If you disagree with me, then you're filled with negative uh, feelings and you're in bondage to your negativity. I'll say that too. And I'm not being judgmental. Now, before we go on to the Apostle Peter, and talk and develop more about this idea of guilt, shame, and fear, and living an authentic life in Jesus Christ instead of this teenage -y kind of relationship with Jesus. I want to speak of the Apostle Paul um, because there's a pesky little problem with Paul. And it's a pesky little problem that, and I say this kind of, my Christian, devout Christian friends who are evangelical have such a terrible time with this. And they have never been able to answer it, but it's still kind of fun to raise it. Isn't it fascinating to note that nowhere, to my knowledge, do we hear um, Paul or read of Paul driven by guilt, shame, or fear? Nowhere. We know that Paul persecuted Christians. We know that Paul was a horrible human being in many respects. We know that Paul was intolerant, bigoted, a racist. But we, and once he figures out who he is and how he's got to grow up, we never hear him talk about oh, the emotional side of this. Yeah, he, he will talk about how once I did this, once I did that. But you don't, you don't get this sense of, this, of, of, of that kind of bondage. Interesting as well, we hear no heart-wrenching emotional outburst of repentance from Paul asking for Jesus to enter his life wipe away his sin, and vouchsafe vouch for him heaven. And this is saying you can't avoid this. Now one of my, my uh, nephews, a sparkling guy, and a really, really good guy, a Wheaton graduate, way, way, way evangelical, he says, well, that's true, but he really did give his life to Christ. And I go, well, you don't know that. It doesn't say that. You're speculating. You can't use scripture that way. Well, he does it anyway. Paul's relationship with the risen Christ is totally adult. Paul is on his way to Damascus. Jesus comes to him, claims him, and there's nothing he can do about it, and he's changed. We, we never read of a confession of guilt out of Paul. He's claimed by Christ. That's what Christ did to me. I never had to say I was sorry for anything. Never once. Paul has an adult relationship with Jesus Christ, and we know this. Nowhere do we read Paul, for example, sobbing out confessions of his horrible past 
as if he's been at some camp meeting with real, with other real sorry and real scared persons. He's not there. He, want, he doesn't have anything to do with that. Now, Paul's life with Christ is just that. It is life. It is without childish emotions that damage and diminish the soul. Now, as for Peter, it's equally fascinating to take a snapshot of him prior to the resurrection and then after the resurrection there at the Sea of Galilee or Tiberias. In his pre-resurrection figure, <coughs> Peter is headstrong, impetuous, somewhat doubting, trusting, somewhat faithful, very faithful sometimes. He reminds me of young people in Christ. He's excited, he's happy, he's eager, he's naive, he's guilt-weary, He's prone to shame. He's afraid of all sorts of things. And frankly, as with young people, that's exactly where he's supposed to be. You know, developmentally speaking, there's nothing the matter with that. There's nothing the matter with, you know, you've got to be 13, 14, 15, don't you, sometime? You've got to be. And you have a 13, 14, 15 relationship with Jesus when you're 13 or 14 or 15. But if you're 30 years old or 50 years old or 60 years old and you're still having a 13 year old relationship with Jesus and you still have fear and you still have shame and you still have guilt, you're still a baby. You're still a child. Why, why would you want, I'm not you, of course, why would anybody want to be a baby in Christ? Well, we know why. It's so that Daddy, the minister, can tell them how to behave so that they can go where, Billy? So they can go where? Heaven. To heaven. And they make them twice as fit for hell as they are themselves. Those ministers... Shame on them. They're not ministers. They're not ministers. Anyway, here you got um, Peter, you know, who's, who's quite a young person. This is in his, the pre resurrection self. <clears throat> and he follows Jesus as we did when we were young, you know, and you go to camp and you burn the fire and you give your life to Jesus and you feel good inside, and that's wonderful. That doesn't matter with that. And then when you look at somebody some way, then you feel guilt, right? And if you do something you weren't supposed to do because mommy and daddy told you not to or your minister, then you feel shame, right? Of course you do. And then you, you find out that if you keep this up, where are you going, Billy? You're going to hell. So you have fear. Shame, guilt, and fear. That's what kids feel, shame, guilt, and fear. And if you're feeling shame, guilt, and fear, and you're 50 years old, then you're still 13, 14, 15, spiritually, developmentally, as a Christian. This noted, uh, as the adult Jesus, this is not the Jesus that's in the, you know, that's in the stable and in the manger. Oh, isn't he cute? But no, it's not that Jesus. <clears throat> the adult Jesus begins to reveal himself to Peter, little by little by little by little. And as he does that, Peter seems to fall back into immaturity as this happens. <clears throat> For example, when, when Jesus starts to, be, it starts to be revealed that, hmm, maybe being a Christian means following an adult Jesus who is going to die for you, and who expects you to behave like an adult and to go out into the world and work for Jesus Christ instead of having to be entertained for Jesus Christ all the time. Well, Peter doesn't like that because he, he likes being entertained by Jesus. This is kind of neat. He does miracles. He brings people back to life. He, he, you know, this is pretty neat. And then pretty neat ends up being pretty serious and... Uh, Peter, like most people, when they're still 12, 13, 14, 15, emotionally in Jesus Christ, they don't like that, kind of get away from that. So anyway, Peter is pretty immature, and I had a note here, certainly we could argue this, 
What perhaps is the greatest sign of immaturity? Well, I have here lying. You ever notice your kids are pretty nice till they get to be about teenagers? And then the lies start. <laughs> David, did I find a pack of cigarettes in your uh, blue jeans? <laughs> Not mine, Mom. <laughs> Couldn't have been mine. I know none of your kids I know smoked, but anyway. Uh, say to me, and that's when the lies start to begin. Where'd you go tonight? Oh, I was out with the girls tonight. Right? Well, anyway, and, uh, and then what's worse, uh, you know, what, well, I won't go into that. Uh, then, then the lies, of course, they become white lies, and then as you become an adult, then instead of telling out out lies like our politicians, you embellish things. Now, of course, you know me, I think that virtually all the politicians are liars, and, uh, and they are. But uh, I have nothing to say for them, and they will be dealt with by Jesus at a later time. Oh, I'm real serious about that, too. I'm real serious about that. So anyway, uh, Peter's a liar, and he's an embellisher. You ever know anybody that, you know, you talk to him, and they, it's not, uh, you know, well... Well, you know. So, as it goes on, Peter then ends up blatantly revealing his childish relationship with Jesus by denying his fellowship with Christ. He lies. Weren't you with him, Jesus? No, I was not. I was not. See, he can't grow up. He has to still be taken care of by Jesus. The church has to take care of him. He's got to go to church and feel good. He can't grow up. Now when a child lies, eventually what is the result? Well, we know what the result is. Guilt and shame. And then fear that you're going to be caught again in your lie. What a way to live a life. And so you lie to cover up your lie, to cover up your, does that sound familiar? I'm not for you, Casey, I'm not there. <laughs> but you know, you lie to cover up a lie, to cover up a lie, remember that? And then what happens, you've forgotten whether you were lying. And then the lie you were told, telling originally becomes a truth. It's all very bizarre. <clears throat> Peter is guilt-ridden. And as such, the more remarkable is, it is how the resurrected Jesus Christ treats it. And I want to talk about this. Uh, how Jesus treats this person who betrays him, who lies to him, who's just a little boy. And I think that's the key, just a little boy. Have you ever known or experienced that guilt and its offspring, shame and fear, is the number one uh, uh, motivator for human change? Have you ever noticed that? This is why cults are so successful. I'll explain a cult real quickly. No, this is not a sidebar because it's important. A cult is nothing more than a place where people share their uh, shared paranoia. So if you believe that the world's going to end, you're going to go to a fellowship that's going to share that with you so that you'll feel good about it. If you're concerned that your daughter or your son's not going to be a virgin, you're going to go to a church that offers, uh, you know, uh, uh, alternatives, you know, to uh, uh, going out you know, with your boyfriend. Because it's safe. Incidentally, you, you, your children are just as likely to lose their virginity if they go to an evangelical church as if they go to the Presbyterian church. And the most, and the church with the least, um, no, with the most healthy um, uh, young people and the least STDs and the least uh, number of uh, pregnancies and sex before marriage is the Unitarian church. Isn't that something? Those old liberals. They're the ones who have the most honorable, virginal, uh, sweetest kids. But that's another story there, too. Cults are successful because they share their paranoia, and this is people get into this, and they all share the same thing that, you know, whatever it might be, whatever your paranoia is, okay? Whatever it is, 
You'll, you'll find a church that will support your paranoia so you don't have to deal with your shame and your guilt and your fear. This is why a lot of churches are very successful. And shame, guilt, and fear, of course, as some of you know, is how parents control their children even when their children become parents. Can you imagine, and I'm sure this affects some people, but I don't know, I'm not a... Can you imagine being an adult parent and having your mother still shame you and make you feel like a creep? And worse yet, allowing that to happen? How, how, you know, if my parents did that to me, well, they, I'd say, go away. Go away. You know, you're not going to do that to me. And, and if you're going to behave like that, you won't see me. Because I will not have a relationship with my parents where I'm treated that way. Period. It's not permitted. It's infantile. It's abusive. It's abusive behavior by a parent. Now, I'm, it's important that you understand this because this is what this is the way we motivate people. This is the way we motivate people in our world. Republicans, oh, we got to have this great big uh, military budget because the commies are now. It's not the commies. It's the Muslims going to come and impose Sharia law on us. Oh, so we got to yeah. stop that. Grow up. Nope, can't do that. We've got to scare people. Anyway, Jesus doesn't behave like that, of course, because um, Jesus is not a 13-year-old or a bad parent. Anyway, Peter is a walking corpse of guilt. Now, what does Jesus do to him? This is the question. Here you've got the person who's betrayed Jesus. Here you've got this, this boy in Jesus, Peter. This guy is filled with guilt. He's filled with shame. He doesn't know what he's going to do. He's really not a very good follower. He's fallen away. <laughs> What's Jesus going to do? Now, what does Jesus do and say to him? Now, follow me. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Does Jesus, does Jesus say to him, after Peter has made these terrible decisions, does he say to him, how dare you do that to me, Peter? How dare you have done that to me? Shame on you. Shame on you. You have embarrassed me. You have embarrassed my parents. You have embarrassed my Heavenly Father. You, you, you have embarrassed God Almighty. Oh, God Almighty is so embarrassed. How can you, God Almighty, you know, my God Almighty Father, you have embarrassed. Now, I'm not joking. If Jesus behaves like that, I will leave the church and I will, I will, I don't have nothing to do with Jesus. But the reason I have something to Jesus to do with Jesus, he doesn't do that. Does Jesus say, how dare you? You have embarrassed me and my family. Shame on you, Peter. Does that sound familiar? Of course it does, because that's the way you were treated and that's the way you treated your kids. How dare you do that to our honor? Or how about this lovely fall? You're in trouble now. <laughs> You're in trouble now. You've been such a bad disciple. You're such a bad disciple. Shame, fear, guilt. Let's motivate our children like that. You're such a bad son. My parents never said that to me. They said I was an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I never said that to me. Well, maybe they did say I was bad. No, <laughs> no, no. It's you know, I understand. This is important. None of that nonsense comes out of the mouth of Jesus. Why is it coming out of the mouth of parents who claim to be Christian, and why is it coming out of the the of pulpits from these boneheads who claim to be ministers? Fie on them! Fie on them! An embarrassment of the gospel. Nothing of this comes out of the mouth of Jesus Christ, who is my Savior at any rate, who is my Lord and Savior. Maybe not anybody else's. Maybe you need, maybe you need a Jesus who's going to punish you. Well, I don't, and I don't have one. No, instead, what Jesus, lover of my soul, does, he comes to the truant Peter, 
and he reinstates him into the fellowship of Jesus Christ by putting him to work. He doesn't say, well, Peter, you're going to have to prove yourself now. <laughs> you're going to have to prove yourself worthy because you've really ticked off my dad. <laughs> what kind of parent does that? Well, I'll tell you what kind of parent. A bad parent. And a bad God. And a bad Savior. Picking on your children like that. Calling them names. Hurting them. Shame on them. Well, Jesus doesn't do that. I think Jesus is a pretty good example to follow. Jesus doesn't hold Peter's immaturity and his failure of faith against him to motivate him to be a good Christian. But rather what he does is he treats him like an adult. And he said, you know something? It's like when Jesus found the woman caught in adultery. What does he say to her? What does he say to her? You've been a bad bitch. <laughs> you old whore. Seriously, is that what he says to her? He says, stop that. It's hurting you. Don't do it anymore. That's all he says. But not ministers today. No, 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 no. No. What Jesus does is he takes the broken, he takes the downhearted, he takes the people who mis made mistakes. Myself, he's taken Alejandro who makes mistakes, and he, take, he takes uh, Stephanie, who I know has made mistakes, and instead of beating them up, has put, put you to work. Because you can do the work. Because you're an adult in Christ. You're not a baby. Do the work. So Peter is put to work. And he's reinstated and he's treated like an adult. And this, if you read carefully the text, this is the effect of Easter Sunday. That people become adults in Jesus Christ and no longer children. And not only that, then they're finally able to go to work for Jesus Christ instead of always having to be taken care of by the rest of the fellowship. We need adults. You're getting there, aren't you? Yeah, you really are. You're getting there. Proud of you. Proud of this church. We have an enjoyable fellowship hour. Minji, praises to you. Safe trip. Godspeed. Let us stand and sing. There is a balm in Gilead. Three, nine, four. <laughs>
gracious and heavenly God, Jesus Christ, and my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, lover of my heart. I thank you for the gift of Easter, and I thank you for the gift of the resurrection, and I thank you for the gift of restoration and renewal. I thank you for the gift of, of, of not having to be a, a, a child in Jesus Christ, but rather an adult. I thank you for the gift of being able to work for Jesus Christ instead of having to be taken care of. I thank you for the gift of adulthood. And may the blessings of Jesus Christ, lover of each and every one of us here, rest upon our hearts, deep in our souls, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.